Uh, hi everyone, welcome back. My name is Chad Toprak. I'm the director of Freeplay, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Freeplay hosts and broadcasts from the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, where stories have been shared and games have been played since time immemorial. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to anyone watching who has a connection to the world's oldest continuing culture. Sovereignty was never ceded and the violence of the colonial project is ongoing. Freeplay also stands in solidarity with black communities, both here and around the world, against prejudice, injustice, and violence. Black Lives Matter is not a new or revolutionary statement, but it is one that needs to be said and said again and said louder. Uh, so welcome to uh, the Immersive Art as Therapy session. Uh, joining us from the UK is Sarah Tico. Uh, Sarah has spent her career working across the interdisciplinary arts as a producer, curator, and researcher. Uh, she's the founder of Hatsumi, a research and design studio that works at the intersections of arts, health, and immersive technology to develop experiences that challenge how we think and feel about the world and imagine in uh, imagine the future of health and well-being. Uh, please make Sarah welcome and uh, over to you. Cool, thank you so so much for having me. We were just talking before the event uh, kicked off about how there are some nice things that seem to be coming out of this lockdown including being able to be part of a conference that is literally on the other side of the world to me. So thank you so much for having me. Um, so, hi, my name is Sarah Tico. Uh, I'm the founder of Hatsumi, uh, which means to see something for the first time. And I'm really interested in how we can make invisible experiences visible through uh, 3D drawing in virtual reality. Um, I'm also the producer on a project called Explore Deep, which I'll talk about later in the talk as well, which is a breath control VR experience. And I'm also the healthcare lead for an organisation called Immersive UK, uh, looking at how we can bring together the immersive uh, industry and support uh, in the development of VR for healthcare as well. So as a little bit of background, uh, so this is the project for the project. This is a uh, a project that I was involved in years and years ago. I was actually a volunteer at a gallery called Fabrica. And I think this was really my introduction to immersive experiences. This is an artwork by um, an artist called Karina Kaikonen and called The Blue Root. And, uh, and just about a year before my dad had passed away, I just finished university, I was studying anthropology. And I think there's that moment where you graduate, where you realise that there's not an institution holding you anymore. And you sort of have to realize what you want to do with your life and uh, and I remember feeling incredibly lost and frightened and just didn't really know what I wanted to do anymore and so I started volunteering here and uh, and it was whilst uh, invigilating in the gallery and having this conversation with all the different uh, sort of attendees that, that came through and, and having a discussion about what this artwork means to them uh, really sort of transformed my understanding of what art could be. Um, before then I thought it was just something that was for a sort of cultural elite and not someone from my sort of background would sort of would engage with it. But, uh, but this was actually a very much participatory experience as well. And so all the shirts that you can see uh, were actually contributed by volunteers on the exhibition. I think mine is just like in the top left here. And there was something about people's stories coming together and the theme was all about grief and loss and all the people that inhabited these shirts and where they are now. And, uh, and I think this was the real moment and having a conversation, these conversations with people in the gallery that really made me think this is something that I really want to, um, to be involved in and just the arts as a tool to really talk about people's experiences. So flash forward a few years later, this is a pretty naff holiday photo uh, of myself in Thailand. But this moment really marks a totally transformative moment in my life. And this photo was taken when I was at the peak of what was later described as a psychotic episode. Um, it had been a couple of years since my dad had passed away. And I think this was my first sort of moment of just having a real break to be able to stop uh, and think about the world and being, I was alone uh, traveling through Thailand for a couple of weeks. And, uh, and it was quite an extraordinary experience. And I think that it's very rare in the sense that I was pretty unscathed, but I think coming back and going through the healthcare system really uh, was one of the most difficult parts of it. And, uh, and being told that there's something like deeply wrong with your brain and struggling to be able to communicate what that, what that feeling was like. 
And I remember being given this code F30.2, which was uh, stands for psycho psych psychosis with manic symptoms. And I just remember feeling like a data point and, you know, you only have a short amount of time to be able to communicate what that experience is like. And remember in that first session, there were people trying to offer me lithium and I felt like I was in a place where I didn't need it, but to be able to sort of explain the context of this entire situation that I found myself in uh, was incredibly difficult. And so on average, you have about 11 seconds to convey your condition to a doctor before you're likely to be interrupted, I later discovered. And being able to, you know, find the words to explore, to, to communicate any type of pain or healthcare condition that you have is very difficult because obviously within that time, uh, you want to be able to really get down to the bottom and find some sort of solution. And so having worked in the arts, I, uh, I really wanted to use the arts and storytelling as a way to be able to communicate what this experience was like for me. Um, until then, I'd just been, you know, an administrator in the arts and a producer in various projects. And I started to try and write for the first time. So I started to write a short story and then that didn't feel right. And, uh, and then I started to write a short film. And again, that didn't feel right. And then I did what uh, lots of us English people decide to do at some point in their lives and they're feeling a bit lost and I moved to Australia and uh, I ended up working uh, with the School of Life uh, and TEDx Sydney before eventually moving to the Big Anxiety Festival which was hosted uh, at the University of New South Wales up in Sydney and, uh, and it was then that I became really or just in the lead up to that that I became really fascinated with virtual reality as a tool to be able to put you in the shoes of somebody else's experience and I think that was very much around the time of uh, Chris Milk if you've ever heard of him I really recommend him look, looking him up and he talked about this idea of virtual reality as the empathy machine and that you can really understand people's experiences through being able to put on a headset I don't think I necessarily agree with that right anymore but I think there's like really interesting ways that immersive technology can be used to build new forms of empathy and so whilst I was uh, working at the festival as uh, a virtual reality curator and a researcher with the university as well, then I met an incredible researcher based, based at the Black Dog Institute in Sydney uh, that has been doing some really incredible work uh, around this existing arts and health research method known as body mapping. So body mapping has been around since around the early 80s. It was developed in South Africa as a tool to enable women living with HIV and AIDS to talk about the embodied experience uh, of living with their condition and naturally there's a lot of stigma um, and has been for a long time around how people talk about those experiences and so this process was developed where traditionally what you do is you trace around your body on a large piece of paper and you go through a mindfulness based experience and you start to think what does the embodiment of this experience look like to me where do I feel pain or emotion and what sort of color or texture or words can you use to uh, describe this? And so this has been used extensively by researchers around the world. Uh, this is some research that was undertaken at the Black Dog Institute in Sydney. Uh, and this was looking at the embodied experience of psychosis. And there's various ways that it's been applied, not only in, in talking about the embodied experience of these painful ex of moments, but also in how do we cope with them? You know, what are the things that really help us? And there's something wonderful about just being able to take up space as well. I think this is what I really enjoyed about running workshops over time is just to be given a giant piece of paper and to be given permission to take up space and really think about our experiences in a very different way um, is incredibly empowering. But I think as someone that has spent most of their, their career as an artist administrator rather than an artist, I became really frustrated with my own sort of inability to be able to uh, communicate that experience in drawing and I felt like what I was trying to communicate wasn't really powerful enough at all um, but there are lots of incredible artists that have been able to do that and I think you know I still was able to do that myself as well uh, this is actually a workshop that I ran last year at Fabrica um, in the same gallery where I first uh, volunteered and so that was a really wonderful experience of being able to go back and, and seeing this sort of journey that we've been I've been on um, but I think that having worked in virtual reality already, I was really excited about thinking about how we could bring together 3D drawing and virtual reality and these sort of beautiful other worlds that you can bring someone into and merging that with body mapping. 
And so that was the development of Hatsumi. Um, initially, it was going to be a PhD that I wanted to do at UNSW, but unfortunately, I didn't get in in the end. Uh, so I ended up moving to uh, Stanford University and doing some research with them there in the hopes to do that. Um, and then realized that I just academia wasn't for me. And that's when I decided to set this up as an independent company that is maybe something halfway between a startup, a research project and an art project. And so what we've been doing is translating body mapping into this VR experience where you have a 3D avatar that uh, mimics your own height. And we're now working so it can have your own sort of bodily dimensions and being able to move the body into different shapes as well. And through the workshops that we've been doing, then we've been co-designing the drawing tools to make sure that they are illustrative of different forms of lived experience. So as you can see in this image here, then this is the palette that you have. And there are a series of different drawing tools. So there's uh, electricity, TV static, people have requested a lot as that sort of fuzzy haziness. Uh, things like throbbing, uh, fire, water, splatters, smoke. And then this curly one here, this is actually one of the first sort of prototyping tools that we put in, uh, just to see if we could integrate some sort of movement based tools into it. And, uh, and it's been really interesting to see that that's actually been quite one of the most commonly used and seems to be metaphorical of, of different types of experience. So I think by translating it into VR, then it's been interesting to see people's use of these different uh, animated drawing tools. Um, of course, there are lots of existing 3D drawing uh, tools available. Things like Google Tilt Brush uh, are incredible to use and much more advanced in the, in the development of the, of the drawing tools they have. But, um, but there isn't an ability to be able to model something into, in, take a model into that experience. Uh, and then we've also been looking at different additional features that we can add into it that can really help uh, support this therapeutic value. So here are a couple of illustrations that people have done so far. I think we probably had about 400 people try it thus far. Um, in the bottom left hand corner, this was a, a really early prototype. And this is somebody telling their partner that they love them for the first time. Um, and so they were trying to illustrate that feeling of your chest almost like expanding and, and wanting to really take someone in and, and hold them. Um, he said that he was really nervous about it. So his cheeks went really red as well, which you can kind of see there. And then he was talking about, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, like when your fingers and, and toes almost have, um, what is that sensation? I've completely forgotten the word. Uh, pins and needles, there you go. Uh, and just that kind of whole embodied physical sensation that he was experiencing. Um, in the bottom right as well, that's a sound designer that was uh, illustrating the, the feeling of making music and that idea that you're trying something out in the world and you're seeing what it's like and then you're having that immediate response and you're keeping on iterating. And I think by bringing it into a virtual environment as well, it's been really interesting to see that people are not just talking about physical experiences in the body it's how your body is relating to the external world and how how do those things play into each other and so you can draw inside the body you can draw on the skin and of course you can draw outside as well and so the way that we've been applying this is in three different ways so first of all we've been looking at how can this improve communication so does that change the conversations that you're having with a doctor when you're talking about your experiences of mental health or your experiences of pain uh, and how can that perhaps you know support that sort of 11 second issue that we have of being able to say look I feel pain here and it's stinging and it hurts and it looks like this uh, and we've also been testing it in hospitals and some people have said that they could show that to another clinician and they could likely tell you what that condition was and so we want to see if we can combine that with things like quantitative data on existing health conditions um, uh, sort of different demographic issues uh, issues that's not the right one uh, different demographics um, and uh, and different sort of standardized health med measures. So things like pain surveys or mental health surveys and being able to compare it alongside that as well. Um, and also as a tool for public engagement, I think it's really important to talk about these like invisible worlds that we experience when it comes to pain and mental health. And so this is an example of a chronic pain patient that we were working with. Um, so this is at Princess Elizabeth Hospital in Guernsey, which is a small island kind of closer to France than the UK. And, uh, and he has a, a form of pain uh, that's been going on for, for years and years now. And we met with him and his uh, consultant nurse. 
And she said that after seeing him for this amount of time, then she could still, she could show that to somebody else and they could tell you what that was. But I think one of the really interesting outcomes of this as well was uh, being at him starting to distinguish between these two types of pain. And so he was using that animated drawing tool, the purple one just there. Uh, and then he was talking about how that's like more of a tickling pain rather than the orange color, which is more of a solid pain. But he also started to talk about this pain that he had in his head and these sort of purple things flying around in there. And so his clinician asked about that and he started talking about the emotional impact of living with chronic pain day to day. And so that ended up resulting in a new referral for him as well. So that was really like helpful to see. Uh, I'm really interested as well in how this can be used as a, a form of health, a health intervention as well and how it could potentially be used in the treatment of chronic pain and mental health conditions. So first of all, I think it's really important that we not only communicate how we're feeling to other people, but I think how do we communicate this to ourselves? Um, and but through developing this, this uh, ability called interoceptive awareness, which is developed through things like practicing mindfulness and journaling and constantly being able to check in with yourself day to day, then by improving your interoceptive awareness, then you're more likely to spot if you're getting ill earlier on um, and, uh, and can sort of act on that as soon as possible as well. Um, and so I think that's been a really helpful tool for me as well. Through lockdown, I've been doing body mapping every day and thinking about, you know, how I feel moment to moment and how things like the lockdown or work and things are affecting myself. And I think by being able to cultivate this form of awareness, then you can start to name it and therefore do something about it. For things like chronic pain as well, almost half the population live with chronic pain. And unfortunately, there isn't um, a cure just yet um, but a lot of the the work in supporting people with chronic pain is around something called acceptance and compassion therapy as well um, so being able to almost befriend that and understand that this is something that you will live with but instead of pushing it away constantly accepting that it's a part of you can really help in that process uh, and ultimately I'm really interested in how it can be used maybe as a tool to improve pain management as well so a lot of research has already been done into the efficacy of virtual reality as a pain management tool in itself um, and can be really effective in reducing pain, even in child labour, um, acute and chronic pain. But I'm really interested in if you are able to externalise a form of pain, if you start to be able to manipulate that illustration of pain and make it smaller or screw it up or, or do some sort of um, activity that can change that then a bit like the placebo when even if you're told this is a sugar pill and it won't do anything but I'm going to prescribe it to you and you're going to take it you know three times a day for the next month and that's enough to make people feel that they are having control of it and can reduce the the feeling of pain so if you're able to externalize your pain and change it in some way if you do that over time does it create the feeling that you have more control over it um, another interesting finding has been around uh, how you can look at different health conditions as well within one person. So this is actually uh, one of my oldest friends. I've known her since I was about three years old and she suffers from a very severe form of body dysmorphia. And so I was like, hey, I'm doing this new like VR project. Would you like to come check it out? And I'm uh, being not a healthcare professional. I de generally ask people, uh, unless we are working with uh, healthcare professionals to draw a positive memory. And, uh, and she really struggled with that. Like we went through the mindfulness experience and she found it really hard to conjure a good moment in her mind that day. And so we did a, a few rounds of, of, of it. And then we talked about, you know, good moments that we'd had. And then she drew this illustration on the left. And so this was her, her illustration of joy. And she said, listen, I really would like to draw my body dysmorphia, actually. And so she went on to do that. And that is the image on the right. And I think seeing the two next to each other really changed the way that I understood her condition. And I think how she did as well. And I think it's really interesting to note that uh, in her illustration of joy, then nothing is embodied at all. It was completely external to her rather than with her dysmorphia she was, she gets really bad ibs and it's often really centered about her stomach she said she gets a sinking feeling and a heaviness in her legs she scribbled out her face because she was saying that she doesn't want to be seen and then these red arrows the sensation of, of uh feeling watched all the time and so we started to talk about you know how can we take some of those things out and put the positive 
sensations of joy as a more embodied experience. Um, but I think that really again changed the conversation about how she how she understood what her body dysmorphia was like. And finally, I think we're really interested in how this can be used in research as well. Can you do population analytics on this? Could you have, for example, um, you know, 500 people with body dysmorphia, dysmorphia looking at how they illustrate body dysmorphia and do things like, you know, your cultural background or your gender uh, influence the way that you understand your pain? Um, and things like, you know, seeing what colours people are using, where in relation to their body um, are they? are they drawing as well? Um, but I think it's also really important to acknowledge that, you know, the context of each person is entirely different and that illustrations alone don't tell the whole story. And that's why we also integrate, uh, we use the microphones in the headset as well, obviously with people's consent so they can uh, verbally describe what they've drawn and the significance it means to them. Because I think a lot of these things you'd look at without understanding. <sighs> um, but I think that this is a really fantastic tool to be able to understand the, the phenomenology, phenomenology of, of pain and sensory experience. Um, when I was working at Stanford, then I was involved in a research project uh, looking at the, uh, it was a cross-cultural research project looking at the sensory experience of communicating with God. And so uh, they went around the world and they spoke to people and asked if they'd ever met God before and what sort of sensory experience was that like? And they started to find real cultural patterns. So for example, in Ghana, in Africa, then people tended to have uh, more auditory experiences rather than in places like Thailand, then people tended to have more visual experiences. So again, like are there ways that we could use this to research a variety of, of different experiences as well? And ultimately, I think like I mentioned before, then I want to be able to create this whole online gallery this is something that we are working on now where you can keep your own personal journal of illustrations day to day, but also you can submit them to these online galleries um, anonymously. So, for example, there could be a, a gallery of anxiety or an ang a gallery of telling someone you love them for the first time. And can we build these sort of terracotta armies of, of lived experience and how can that change the narrative of, of how we understand these internal worlds? <clears throat> internal worlds that um, that we exist in day to day. Uh, so I think that's it for uh, that, that section. What I'm going to do now is just talk a little bit about another project I'm involved with and then how this all comes together at the end as well. So DEEP is a project that I first came across uh, when I was working at the Big Anxiety Festival in Sydney as well. So this was actually the first project that I ever showed as a curator and I've just been absolutely in love with it ever since. And so I joined them last year as their producer. Uh, so DEEP is a, a breath controlled virtual reality experience that was developed uh, by Owen Harris and Nikki Smith uh, in collaboration with the Games for Emotional Mental Health Lab in the Netherlands. And I think this should be a little introductory video. Here you go.
So over the last four years, then, the DEEP team have been collaborating with Radboud University look, to look at how effective this is in reducing anxiety, predominantly in young people, as, as the res research that we've done so far. So uh, some of the research has been, that, or one of our, our most recent publications has been about how it can be effective in reducing disruptive classroom behaviour uh, in children with complex needs. And we found a significant uh, a significant result in reducing that anxiety and, and disruptive behaviour for up to two hours afterwards. Um, a large randomised control trial has also just been developed. So we have a, an incredible uh, PhD student called Joanna Kaverd Meister, who's uh, been working on it as a PhD full time for the last four years. And she's just developed a large trial looking at how effective it is in reducing anxiety among uh, university students as well. Uh, so we've recently been looking at how it can be applied in response to COVID. So, for example, how it can be used to uh, help people with breathing pattern disorders and uh, in a hospital in Torquay uh, in southwest England. Then a VR wellbeing lab has been set up predominantly for staff as a way of supporting them through obviously incredibly stressful time. Um, and now we're looking at how it can be applied in things like supporting people with uh, women in childbirth, uh, post ICU delirium and various other conditions as well. Uh, and also last year, then we opened an installation at the Nemo Science Museum uh, called Being Human. So this is a permanent exhibition that we have, uh, which is uh, a non-VR version of the experience because naturally one of the issues with VR is how do we how do we show these experiences uh, easily, uh, especially in, in a post-COVID era then thinking about using biofeedback and VR headsets is going to be a little bit challenging. Um, but I absolutely love this installation because I think it's really kept the, the, the full concept of, of how you can see your breath being mirrored in the world. Uh, and so with this installation, then you have the biofeedback belt, which is a seat belt that you're holding across your diaphragm still. And then underneath is something called the butt kicker, uh, which is a bit a uh, haptic feedback uh, thing that the experience that, that uh, is in the chair. So that as you breathe, then you're feeling the vibrations moving through the entire chair uh, and then a sound either side as well. And so it's been great as well being able to see how people are hacking this uh, in really playful ways. And we've seen friends that are doing it together and breathing in tandem. And I think there's some really interesting opportunities for how this can be applied in collaborative uh, group breathing exercises as well. And so uh, the team behind is really fantastic as well. And I think, you know, a beautiful illustration of how art and science can come together. So like I mentioned, the project is directed by Owen Harris and Nikki Smith also supports on it as well. And we have an entirely amazing creative team behind it. They've really worked together to co-design the project. And I think it's a really interesting example of how, uh, how you can bring together people from seemingly very different industries uh, to develop something together. And so I think that VR has really sort of fascinated me the last few years. I, I never thought it was something that I personally would be interested in. Um, and initially approaching it from a storytelling tool, I've now sort of discovered all the different ways that it can be applied in healthcare. And, uh, and I think that a lot of this pins down to this idea of belief and the fact that virtual reality in all these different experiences is able to sort of leverage the neuroplasticity of the mind and we're, it's, we're able to use it as a tool to untangle problems that we may have come up or discovered in the past uh, and create new mental maps as well and I think the variety of the ways that, that VR is being applied is really fascinating and I'm really excited about how we can work together to think about how this can be applied. I think it's absolutely amazing that it can be used in, in pain management and the fact that it's not being used broadly when it could be used, you know, in, in tandem or even potentially to replace in the future um, opioids and more sort of pharmacological interventions, I think is, is really important to explore and the like, high level of addiction um, is, is deeply problematic and so thinking about how that could be for example prescribed uh, or available in things like public libraries is, is really important. Uh, it can be used extensively in things like physiotherapy as well, motivating people to continue to engage in, um, in their exercises as well and learning these new skills. Um, as, as what's happened with DEEP is that you can start to practice this skill within the game environment but I think it's about how can you bring that into the rest of your life and, and learn these new habits as well. 
again with telepresence as well I'm sure everyone's feeling a bit zoomed out at the moment uh, but thinking about how we can interact with people in different ways and how would having a virtual reality conversation with somebody uh, perhaps enhance or change uh, how, how telemedicine works and how important body language is in communication with people. Um, there's some really interesting work around self-counselling as well, um, a project called Freud Me um, by a researcher called Mel Slater. And so uh, I think that's a really interesting example of uh, exploring the embodied experience of virtual reality. And so with that uh, experience, then you wear a VR headset and you see yourself embodied in a VR experience. And across the room is Sigmund Freud. And you're invited to uh, tell him your problems. And once you finish describing it, then you swap bodies with him and suddenly you're embodied in Sigmund Freud and you're listening to yourself as somebody else uh, telling you your problems and then you're invited to come back and, uh, and give yourself advice. And this is based off this idea of Solomon's paradox, that it's always so much easier to tell other people what to do with their problems than uh, it is for yourself. And, and they found that it was really effective in creating the sense of self-efficacy and, uh, and that people felt like they were more uh, empowered to do something about their problems as a result. Um, they've done, I think, additional research on if you change that person, does that change the kind of advice that you give for yourself? So I think they've done Michelle Obama me and Steve Jobs me. Uh, and I think that would be so cool, just as something that, that we could potentially, you know, play with and have something that's, that's more available. Uh, and looking at how we can give ourselves pep talks uh, and new perspectives that we can get out of that. Um, VR has also been used extensively in things like exposure therapy as well, so things that are perhaps frightening for us to be able to do in, in real life, or just not realistic as well. If you've got a fear of heights, uh, it's not very it's not very practical for your psychologist to take you, uh, you know, in an aeroplane or to the tallest building. But you can do this in the safety of a psychologist's office and start to develop, you know, new new coping mechanisms as well. Um, a really big project here in the UK by uh, called Game Change by Oxford VR and a whole collabor uh, group of collaborators has been looking at how virtual reality can be applied uh, as a form of almost exposure therapy for people with psychosis and mild agoraphobia and creating environments that they would find challenging to go to so things like the London Underground or the Job Centre and starting to develop these new skills to, to you know re-engage them with the world. Again, with relaxation, experiences like deep, but for those of you that have used VR, or even just going into the home screen is often a really relaxing experience. Creating this momentary uh, escape is really valuable. Um, and obviously combining it with things like biofeedback like we have with Deep is, is really valuable for being able to create this, you know, internal awareness of the relationship between your brain and your body. But I think we, have, we can learn some really interesting things about ourselves and the data that we can gather from this, if, if done responsibly, can be really fascinating. Uh, and VR has been used extensively in, uh, in different forms of research to be able to gather new information. Um, a researcher called Skip Rizzo, who's based at USC in California, uh, has developed uh, an ADHD uh, test in virtual reality where you're still doing the ADHD test, but you have all these different distractions and things around you. And they're measuring how much are you moving and responding to that and how does that um, match with the test that you've just undertaken. And then finally, of course, with um, art and creative expression and, and what I've been doing with, with Hatsumi and body mapping, but also more broadly looking at how it can be applied as a form of art therapy as well. And when you don't have access to all of the tools that you, that you like or that you can't even be in the same room as somebody anymore, like can we start to run art therapy sessions remotely for people in lockdown? Um, and I think that we need to start thinking about how we can that we can support people that live remotely anyway. But I think lockdown has really highlighted the need for this. Um, there's an incredibly vast amount of academic research available out there. Um, and I think that one of the really interesting and leading researchers in this field is someone called Brennan Spiegel. Uh, and he does some really in interesting work about sort of summarizing the different applications of VR in healthcare. And I think this diagram is a really useful uh, description of how we can sort of tune into the inner and outer worlds and how do we create this dinner, different forms of awareness that can be applied to different health conditions. Uh, so thinking about how we can enhance healthy body Body attention through things like VR, uh, but also how we can sort of drown out the, the outer world and think about our own internal processes as well. 
so what happened was I think guess like after I moved I was working on the big anxiety festival like I said I moved to America and, and worked there for a bit and then it was this process of of deciding that I wanted to move away from this idea of uh doing a PhD and starting out as a company when I first moved back to the UK in May 2018 and I just didn't know where to start and I really wanted to begin by finding a community of people that were working in this space um, because there's such it's such a vast area but I wanted to find a place that I could belong and find support and you know understand what other people were doing as well and um and there just wasn't anything like that here and I spoke to various other startups that said if you think that you're going to get into the NHS just think again it's just not going to happen and lots of people were talking about how they'd gone abroad to uh, be able to bring their their project put in physiotherapy and VR to different hospitals um, but it just felt very very fragmented here and it was just at the birth of an organization called Immerse UK that um, or an organization that uh, were partially funded by the government to bring together the immersive economy and so initially I approached them and said, hey, guys, I, I don't know if you are particularly interested, but I think that there is a real problem here. And, you know, the hospitals are not speaking to the academics and the academics aren't speaking to the artists and the games developers. And you can't have anything beautiful or exciting or compelling without everyone sort of coming together and just thinking about, you know, how these things are even distributed. And so over the last two years, then we've been working together extensively to think about how we can uh, overcome this and create more of a community. And so um, our first event was amazing, if I say so myself. Uh, we worked in collaboration with the Institution of Engineering and Technology in this just beautiful library uh, that was just by the Thames. Uh, and we brought together patients and doctors and artists and developers to talk about all of these things and the different uh, projects that people are working on. Um, we've also been running a, a touring series with a bank called Barclays uh, and their Eagle Labs, which are like maker spaces across the UK. And we've been talking about anything from how it's been used in pain management to art therapy and femtech in VR as well. Um, and I think that's been really powerful as a way of just looking at all the different things that are happening regionally. And with each event, then we'll have an artist, a startup and a researcher and just thinking about how do we create this common language to enable us to really work together. Uh, we've also done innovation sprints as well, which has been really fun. It's almost like a mini hackathon uh, with in-game that are part of Abate University in Dundee. And that was great. There were like developers from um, the original Grand Theft Auto sitting there with psychiatrists thinking about what the future of, of VR and healthcare could look like. Uh, and we've been also developing a series of papers as well and starting to petition the NHS to think about how we can we, can we how can we create a strategy and think about you know how what does the future of this look like and a real pipeline from an artist coming up with an idea to matching them with a psychologist and thinking about how it could potentially be prescribed in the future as well. Um, we've also done lots of uh, webinars and Christmas celebrations that was really nice. I think there's just something really important about community in the first place and just being able to chat with people and have these new collaborations that, that are built out of it as well. Uh, and working with other organisations like Nesta, which are the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts that um, have been doing some really interesting work about uh, bringing together the creative industries and VR for mental health as well. So I really feel like COVID has definitely highlighted the desperate need for bringing together digital technologies to support mental well-being. Um, I think there's going to be, and many people are now just exploring, you know, what this means for us as a global population and the sort of mental health tsunami that is uh, very likely on its way. And I think through bringing together creative industries, mental health professionals and emerging existing technologies, has a real potential to transform uh, healthcare. And I think how this uh, links to things like social prescribing models. So um, in the UK, then there's a new model being trialed where if you go to the doctor with low level mental health problems or chronic pain, then you can be prescribed onto somebody called a link worker, which is able to, uh, somebody that's able to have a more holistic conversation with you about your general well-being, your financial situation, what sort of you know, social support do you have? And based off of that, then they can prescribe you arts-based experiences. Uh, so it could be that there is a choir down the road or a community group that do X, Y, Z 
and through being part of a community then this is a real sort of form of preventative care and thinking about how we can bring care into the community until waiting until people are so unwell that they need much more severe interventions and so through you know in motivating people to do exercise at home and creating social experiences in VR where for example you could sing together or create art together I think is really a powerful tool in supporting people's mental well-being and again obviously and how it can be used in treatment as well um, but like I said at the beginning I think that you know there's been a real struggle in finding out where do we belong in all of this? And I think that I've really struggled with that. And as much as lots of funding bids really, you know, cry out for interdisciplinary collaborations, then I think it's been, at least I found it really hard as an independent to find out, you know, where, where does this exist? And I think it's so exciting that it is bringing together all these different ideas of art and science and how VR brings together the brain and the body. And I think it is really blurring these lines between reality and imagination. And so, yeah, I think it is somewhere in the middle between startup, art project, academic research. And I got an opportunity to cherry pick from all the different strengths of these industries and recreate a new one. And I think it's not about being interdisciplinary. I think it's about being antidisciplinary and that we all have different expertise, but we can bring them together to create a whole new way of working. And actually, through my experience of, of Deep and Hatsumi, then I think that the, the developers come up with incredible ideas on, on, on the therapeutic aspects, but also having the scientists that can uh, influence the design as well. And I think that it has opportunities to belong in a lot of different places as well. Like I just came up with a list with a collaborator the other day about, you know, where would this stuff even exist? And like, it's everywhere. I don't think it's realistic to ask people to invest in VR headsets all the time because no one can afford to. It's incredibly expensive. And I think that we need to acknowledge that. But thinking about how these things can be made publicly available in schools, thinking about how it can be applied to workplace well-being, how it can be available through arts organizations, libraries, theaters, uh, train stations, and airports. Like, you know, we're just getting forced to shop when we were when we were traveling. Um, but thinking about, you know, are these moments where we could really, you know engage in our own health as well um, and so I think that there are lots of places that can be, belong but until then we need to think about what are the best ways for us to begin working together and so I think collaboration is incredibly uh, you know a, a very important starting point of that and even just thinking about the fun structures that underpin these collaborations is really really important um, being able to work with universities is great but that process of identifying the right collaborator, meeting them, having those discussions, identifying the right funding to apply for in the application, and just even negotiating things like IP can be really, really challenging. And whilst universities, the lecturers and, and, and you know your collaborators there are, are salaried, like all of that is your time without necessarily a guarantee. And so I think we really need to think about how we can create new opportunities to bring people together in the first place and making sure that artists and independents are supported and are still able to come up with great ideas and have some ownership of them um, instead of just thinking about how these, these big institutions can sometimes uh, take much more than you'd hoped. But on the other side of that, then I think, you know, these collaborations can be really powerful and there's much more funding available. This is a really, you know, exciting area that I think people are increasingly interested in, in supporting. And I think, you know, as independents who often are working project to project, then there is, you know, a great, great deal of opportunities available there and credibility as well. Um, and I think, you know, the games industry is one of the, the biggest games or you know creative industries in the world so I think being able to bring that together with healthcare can create a really you know supporting and exciting future as well but um but I still think that diversity is a huge huge issue I think especially in the VR world then you often don't see very much of it and so I think we need to think really critically about who uh, is making these experiences and how do we have the most diverse number of voices involved in the experience and I think especially that comes to uh, how you work with patients in the process as well and make sure that the patient vo voice is really involved in it throughout um, because it is often left aside. Um, I think that the Game Change Project by Oxford VR is a really 
brilliant example of how they have what made developed workshops to, uh, involve patients in the co-design. But I think they also said that even having someone involved in the development team would, would have really benefited the project as well. Um, infrastructure just still doesn't really exist as well. I think we need to think about standardization of, of certain elements of it and best practice. How is this industry even going to be regulated? You know, are these going to be med is virtual reality for health going to be considered software as a medical device? And I think that is very likely where it's going as well. Um, the FDA in the US have started to have uh, started to talk about this as well and there's been the first FDA cleared video game by Achille Interactive uh, and so thinking about how that process is going to work and how you do sort of accredit uh, experience in this is in the first place and then also cyber security as well thinking about how do we ensure that if we're bringing together games and and health then how do we protect what is essentially medical data as well the XR Safety Initiative, which is led by Caviar Perlman, are doing some really exciting work on this as well. So I think if you do want to learn about cybersecurity, specifically in VR, then I definitely recommend checking her out. Um, and there's also a really good research paper by Jeremy Balenson from the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab, who talks a lot about how we can protect nonverbal data in VR as well. Uh, and then finally as well, I think we need to think about how we do invest in this in, in, in new ways uh, and thinking strategically about that. How do we involve artists and, and games developers uh, and how do we, again, support these collaborations in meaningful ways? Uh, educating people about it as well. I take so much pleasure in talking about the applications of VR and health because so many people do not know about it. And I think there are increasingly more articles about it. but. Um, but there is still, you know, a really big knowledge gap and just being able to educate people and not just the fact that these experiences exist, but I think when you bring together games developers and artists, then you can make them even better. And, um, and I'd love to see more opportunities for bringing together these two different industries in the future. Um, and again, just sharing more knowledge, talking about the evidence based as well. Um, there's Frontiers, which are a really fantastic publication, have now opened their own virtual reality publication for that. And there's lots of uh, organisations that are now bringing out more information about this as well. Um, there's the International VR Healthcare Association that do some really useful events and support the community uh, and also lots of conferences around the world as well. Virtual medicine is a really big one that happens in LA. So if you are interested in reading more about this, then perhaps look at the speakers from the events gone by. And finally, I think distribution as well, like that is the, the biggest issue that I've sort of touched on already about where it could potentially go. But I think we do really need to think about, you know, that again, the whole pipeline and how we make things available and how this can work with, with the healthcare system as well. So we're definitely at the beginning of a, a pretty big journey, but um, hopefully then we can now start to think about new ways of being able to work together. So um, I think that's all from me probably got about 10 minutes left for questions so um yeah happy to take any questions that anybody has thank you As game makers, where would one go to begin to collaborate with health experts on immersive experiences centered around health and well-being? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I think, you know, it's important just to look locally at uh, universities uh, that are doing interesting work around this already. Uh, I think, yeah, just beginning with that and just seeing, you know, what people are potentially already working in this as well. Um, I think that being able to speak to people that already have some understanding of the applications in VR and health 
has been really really helpful whilst there is you know great value in being able to speak to people that are new about it uh, we've also been working with hospitals as well and I think there's a real opportunity to even start speaking to your local you know hospitals or GP clinics to think about how that works as well um, there are lots of hospitals that have big research grants uh, and uh, are really open to collaborating with people but I think it's just about finding the right person uh, and sometimes you could meet someone that is perhaps interested but has a billion other projects and may not you know be fully available but um, I'd say don't encourage and if that collaboration doesn't necessarily work out there is someone that that will be um, and especially at the moment or in times of crisis there's a real openness to doing things very differently as well I know that some of my colleagues that worked uh, on Grenfell Tower which was um, a huge disaster that happened here a few years ago well, there was a major fire uh, where 72 people died and there was a huge you know mental health crisis that happened as a result of the trauma that people experienced uh, and so uh, I think through finding the right collaborators there they ended up doing this brilliant project where it wasn't even about creating new experiences it was about how can we how could they bring uh, creative uh, entertainment based VR experiences to the victims of the fire but they were facilitated by psychologists and uh, and through that they managed to increase the referrals into their psychology services by quite a significant amount so I think yeah hospitals and universities are def definitely really good places to start but also speaking to other therapists as well uh, what nascent VR technologies like eye tracking, facial tracking and body tracking are you most excited about and what new use cases do they open up? Um, great question. Uh, there are so many new ways of being able to track the body and I think that there's you know almost limitless new new ways. I think things like facial tracking being to track being able to track emotions and how people are responding is is really valuable. Eye tracking as well. Um, is looking at you know where people are paying attention to and I think how that can improve your understanding of where people are engaging and where people are, are not in a game can be really helpful for the development process but I think you know we need to start talking more about inclusivity and making VR more accessible to, for people and not everyone has the ability to be able to use things like the controllers so I think being able to use yeah, even things like um, EEGs to control the game using your, your thoughts is uh, really exciting. Um, there is a really great organization called Helium. So that's H-E-A-L-I-U-M. And they've been integrating things like Apple Watches and Fitbits or the Muse headband, which is usually used for um, sort of monitoring mindfulness activity. Uh, and they've done some really good work with uh, being able to do sort of biofeedback driven narratives. So, for example, in a game, then you have to do slow, deep breathing. And then once you get to a certain level, it will like release the butterflies or a new part of the story will emerge. Uh, so I think being able to control stories with your body is is really exciting. Uh, and body tracking as well, even when the most simple thing, like, uh, I saw a group that met up in VR chat, which is like a social VR chat room, and we're doing break dancing together in VR. And being able to, you know, dance together and really feel that that sense of connection, but also start to really hone in on your own skills, for example, as a dancer uh, and being able to create this new sort of awareness and, and new perspective on how you move as well. Um, and again, in physiotherapy, it's really valuable. So my internet connection is unstable. That's not good. It's all right. Uh, especially for tools that need to make specific claims, how do you connect with experts to validate your implementations and have a scientific basis? Um, I think that's where, you know, collaborations with, with researchers is really, really important. Um, I don't know what the, the, how it works in the medical community in Australia, but, um, but yeah, I think here, first of all, you know, have, having people that understand that research uh, in the first place is really important. Uh, but looking at when you're developing things, how it potentially adheres to the medical guidelines as well. And, you know, if you are thinking about developing something as a medical intervention, then researching the current legislation 
on software as a medical device and maybe getting some advice on how it can potentially be compliant from the beginning. Um, I think that there's a really blurry line between what is a well-being experience and what is a health intervention. Um, but if you're starting to think about how, for example, your work can be brought into hospitals and used there, then, um, then it, it's worthwhile doing that research to begin with. But also you're, you're opening up to a, a huge, you know, new industry, uh, which can potentially be quite lucrative as well. Uh, can you speak more to conscious embodiment in patients using medical VR software as opposed to transcendent responses? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand this question, so I might just go on a, on a slight tangent with that. Um, and I think that there's some really interesting overlap. Uh, well, if we're talking about transcendent, uh, trans, transcendent experiences, then thinking about how this overlaps with a lot of the really interesting research that's happening around psychedelics uh, and therapy. I think there's now more of an interest in understanding of yeah, the impact of, of psychedelics and supporting people with mental health issues. And I think being able to uh, prescribe or use these as controlled experiences that still perhaps uh, can reflect these sort of trans transcendental states uh, can be really powerful in supporting people and there's a whole movement uh, of this research which is called cyberdelics or technodelics uh, there's a really fantastic games developer called Robin Arnott that developed a game called Sound Self that's a sound-based cyberdelic and he recently wrote the cyberdelics manifesto which talks even more about this and uh, and the interaction of biofeedback in games if you could ask VR, uh, VR hardware manufacturers for one feature uh, you wish we had today what would that be these are such good questions um, hmm, I think, uh, I think it has to be around cybersecurity and enabling us to be able to have much more transparency about how that a data is collected, what people have permission and ability to use, and also how we can interpret that as well, because like, that's a, it's a really valuable part of even the games development process, right? Understanding how things are being used, but I think there needs to be much more transparency in what data is being used and how, for example, it could be made more accessible for healthcare researchers as well. And so being able to have a really robust back end and thinking about how, for example, that could uh, inter integrate with medical records. Um, I think that's going to be really complicated and clunky to begin with, but I think, you know, thinking about this, this, this back end and how we support uh, researchers through that is going to be really important. See if we've got any more questions coming up. I'd really like to give these questions more of a think and perhaps um, uh, write some more about it afterwards. Um, I don't really usually speak at games festivals, so it's really nice to have, yeah, very different questions to, to what I'm used to. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, this was, yeah, a really interesting experience being able to yeah, be part of something super far away uh, and probably the most nervous I've been about a talk before as well. So I hope you enjoyed it. And, uh, and yeah, please do get in touch if you have any questions or if I can help in any way. So yeah, thank you so much, Chad and everyone at Please Replay. Um, yeah, peace, love.